I guess one of the reasons that uh, I chose wearables um, over any other kind of art form is that it's a functional piece. It can, it can be worn, it can be used, it can be admired. For some reason, when I make the body pieces, they seem like clothes to me. And when I do a headdress, it, it's sculpture to me. It can live without a person in it. I don't really care if someone buys it. I don't care if they ever wear it. Since the mid-1970s, one of the liveliest phenomena in visual art and design has been wearable art. Artist designers exploring the creative potential of various textile techniques have developed strong personal statements in the form of wearable body adornments. California has played a role in this movement, attracting and supporting many of the major artists in the field. Two such artists working with manipulated cloth are Candace Kling and Ellen Hopley. Although they share common processes of pleating and folding, their approaches to wearable textiles provide an interesting contrast. Oakland artist Candace Kling is best known for her one-of-a-kind fantasy headdresses. Fine art classes at Oakland's College of Arts and Crafts and Parsons School of Design in New York led the way to the study of fashion arts at the College of Alameda. She established a small business with her husband in the 1970s and produced painted dresses for six years. After this period of highly commercial work, she felt the need to return to art and resumed her drawing classes. So I drew for two years at, at Arts and Crafts, and in the second year, as a drawing major, you have to take a class called Drawing Project. And in that class, you have to choose an idea, a theme, a technique and stick with it through the entire semester and it had never occurred to me before to do that to do a series which all artists do but I had never done before always before that I had tried to put all of my ideas into one pillow into one dress into one quilt and oftentimes it would be a little bit awkward because I was trying to put too much into one piece and so in this class uh, you could push and pull and each drawing I could, I could take something from the first drawing, which I enjoyed, and amplify it in the second drawing. I could get rid of things that I didn't, I didn't enjoy. And what I ended up doing in that series was doing costume figures, which I had had no interest in textiles for two years, but somehow they came back around, and I started doing really gra graphic fantasies. I wasn't considering at all how these things would be made, but they came around. After that, after school was over, still the drawings that I had been doing in class, I didn't consider my own art, and I think it's a crisis that a lot of people go through when they get out of art school. What am I going to do that's really mine? It's very easy when you're given an assignment to, uh, to come up with an answer to someone else's problem, but when it really is supposed to represent you, that's much more difficult. So I, uh, I sat there, I was really pretty frozen for about a year, and in that time I went to work at Bazaar Bazaar, which is an antique clothing store, doing alterations and restoration of their garments. And at a certain point during that year, I started noticing that there were all sorts of details on the dresses, on jackets, things on the hats, really intriguing, little folds and rosettes, all sorts of things. And I somehow I didn't want it to get away and so I started making samples sometimes I would buy something but oftentimes it would be a dress that I wasn't interested in but somehow the fold was interesting so I started making samples and I would bring them home and put them in my studio but I, I still didn't have anything in particular in mind to do with them and at a, a certain point during that year a friend came over and she had a little flight helmet it was like a, a copy of a 1940s flight helmet. It was quilted, it was purple and green, it had little buttonholes here with little padded pillows hanging off of it, and I was, I was really charmed by it. It just was really wonderful. And I think at that point, the techniques that I'd been finding, the, the fantasy drawings that I'd been doing, and uh, this helmet all kind of gelled together, and I started working on my first headdress. 
Within a year, there was uh, a competition at Fiberworks called Exhibits Projects, and I had never shown any of my work, but I applied for it. I actually applied for it not having finished all of the pieces. They were kind of tucked together in the back, but in the photographs, they looked finished, and I had a year before the show, so I figured that I could get it together in that year, and I was accepted to do that show, so in, I guess that was 1981. I had my first show and produced, I guess, about eight pieces in that year. I had a board in my studio, and I'd been collecting all these techniques, and at a a certain point, people would come in the studio and they'd say, well, what is it? And I didn't have any names for it, but I was really intrigued by it. And they would say, well, are you going to teach it? And I hadn't had any idea of teaching it, but I started to think, well, if I am going to teach it, I'm going to have to describe each of these pieces and explain how to do it. And it, I wasn't looking forward to the idea of having to illustrate every one of these. But it occurred to me that if they existed, if they existed on garments, then someone had to have taught someone how to do it already. Candace pursued her research at the Oakland Library, studying the decorative techniques illustrated in the backs of old sewing books. She also studied the collection of historic costumes at the Oakland Museum and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. I found many, many more techniques there, to the point now where I have hundreds. And I have many of them still in their research form. I haven't done samples of them. But there are probably between 10 and a dozen techniques. They kind of overlap each other. I can't, I can't totally categorize them because I'm, they don't really have names, some of them. There's quilling and ruching, cockades, rosettes, ladder work, all these different names that I've found. But there are also a lot of things which seem to defy categorization. For the headdresses, there are certain techniques, they, they need to be able to articulate. They need to be able to kind of go around corners and make curves. And many, many of the techniques are more appropriate for quilting, for pillows. They can be washed. They're completely flat. But they won't go around, around corners. I need techniques that are, that are flexible. And so I'll make many things which are single pieces and then I'll sew the single pieces together, and they'll, they'll be flexible. And this allows me to go around the, the three-dimensional three head. I also use uh, a lot of what I call single increments, which are these tiny little pieces, which are kind of like shingles. And I can fill in a space, almost any shape space, that I need to. I also use techniques that are called ruching, and ruching is uh, the quality of gathering, and there are many different uh, ways of doing it. And I use that to, to fill in areas that are perhaps odd-shaped, where you couldn't exactly cut a pattern to do it. So although there are many things I'm finding in my research, a lot of them don't apply, only, only certain ones. And of those, I may have found historically one thing that works, and then from there I take in and invent. Because mainly what happens is I find that when the fabric is in my hands, it begins to talk back. And I'll start to play with it and realize the, the potential of what's happening. One of the pieces, I've ended up doing several pieces with this particular uh, spiked technique in mind. And what happens is that I will think that I'm making a piece that looks one way. And as I'm holding it and moving it, I'll realize what else the fabric can do. And so that may echo the next piece. It will tell me what I need to do next. And I, I won't necessarily go into that right away. I'll probably hold off. I'll finish the piece that I'm doing and then say, well, I'll take this part, almost th the same as in drawing project. That's a good idea. And so I'll take it and I'll put it into the next piece. I've been asked uh, whether I'm going to do whole body pieces. And I've worked on them. I've done some breastplates. I'm working now on a corset piece. But I still keep going back to the head. It, it interests me more. I, for some reason, when I make the body pieces, they seem like clothes to me. And when I do a headdress, it, it's sculpture to me. It can live without a person in it. I don't really care if someone buys it. I don't care if they ever wear it. The breastplate somehow looks as if it's waiting to be put on when I look at it, whereas the headdresses don't. They can just sit there, and, and that would be just fine. The corset is 
interesting to me. It also somehow echoes the shape of the body. And so you look at it and think about the body that might be in it, but it almost is a body in itself. And I think that the headdresses also are like a portrait. It is as if the person is there and you look at it and you say, well, who, who would wear this or who did wear this? And there's somehow a, a sense of history in the pieces. Many people will look at them and say, oh, they look Greek or they look Trojan or they look Aztec. And this puzzled me for a long time because I didn't study, his, I didn't study headdress historically. And yet they were looking historical. And I finally realized that headdress has been used so much historically. It's been used for thousands of years. And almost every, almost every form has been done on the head. So if you put something straight out of the top of the head, it's going to look Trojan or perhaps Hawaiian. If you make something bright red and gold, people are going to relate to it as being Aztec. If you uh, tip up the edges or put some sort of medallion across the front, it's going to look Japanese. And although I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mixing these things together, I just do what happens to work with the techniques. But people find that they, they see those things in it, and yet the techniques that I'm using, the fabric that I'm using, makes them look a little bit futuristic. So there's this sort of blend of the past and the future. And I think people look at them and, and think about that. They, it makes them wonder who would wear it. It makes them think about themselves. And I, I really I enjoy that. I try to work in the studio every day. I find that it's a lot more fruitful. And what I learned from that was that if you work even two or three hours a day, if I put the needle down, the scissors down, whatever I've been working on, on the table and go away, I come back the next day, I can pick it right up. There's no trauma of beginning. There's no white canvas. My God, what am I going to do? I have to have an idea. I'm always in the middle. And then somehow, in sometime during the day, I'll have another idea or whatever. But they'll always be, uh, the process will always be ongoing. If you decide every two weeks to come into your studio, there is such a trauma just getting started. You somehow, you have to rearrange it all and you have to get settled and then you, you spend so much time thinking about what it is you're going to do. Whereas if you work every day, you just settle right in and you start. And so the, the time is very productive. But as productive as that can be, I still run, in, I run into lots of snags. And I may have a piece that will sit there for months because I can't solve it. I don't draw them beforehand. I really don't know what the fabric will do. It often surprises me. Oftentimes I can't solve it. And I won't, I won't just finish it just to have it done. I, it has to please me. It has to technically work, and it has to please me aesthetically. And if it doesn't, I just stop on it, which is the reason that I have many things going at once, up to five pieces going at the same time. And I, I don't torture myself about it. I put it away, and I start on something else. And two months later, one month later, a week later, the idea will, it will just occur to me what I should do to solve the other piece. And so I'll go back, and I'll pull it out, and I'll continue working on it. And it may, you know, it, it can take months for a piece to actually finish. Oftentimes, it's why I can't really say how long they take, although I know I did eight in a year, and maybe they take about 150 hours. To, to finish a piece, but oftentimes I'll make, you know, I'll make a hundred little points and say, that's the answer, and I'll make them all, and I'll put it all together, and I won't like it, which is the reason why I have a table that's filled with all sorts of spare parts. Sometimes I'll, I'll make something, and it just won't work, and, and yet I'll find in another piece that perhaps that is the answer. So I have all of these things along with my board, which, uh, which I will refer to. It's kind of my way of helping to solve. I'll get to a certain point where I don't know what I want to do next because I don't have a completely clear vision. I'll, I may start and say, OK, I, I want the top of the piece to have these points. And I'll say, okay, that's the main form. But what am I going to put here? What kind of sides is it going to have? And I won't completely know. And so I may do fir the first, the second, the third stage of it and still not really have it all solved. And so it evolves as I go. I don't really consider how many hours I put into a piece. I'll, 
I really can't tell you exactly how many go into each one. I don't put a monetary value on it. I won't finish a piece just to have it done. I wait until it pleases me. And for that reason, I obviously am not doing it to make a living at it. I would hope at some point it might support me, hopefully in the future. But at this point, I teach. I do other kinds of sewing, whatever I have to do. I think I did so much sewing for money where the criteria, it was always someone else's criteria. And it was the lowest common denominator, oftentimes. It, it's a very hard limitation to be creative in the limitation of time and money. And so uh, perhaps you can say this is total self-indulgence, to be able to do exactly what I want to do to the nth degree. It's a real pleasure. Ellen Hopley, a Berkeley designer, established a one-woman business in 1977, producing pleated clothing, exhibited in craft galleries and museums throughout the United States. She has developed unique collaborative relationships with the San Francisco Pleating Company, her photographer and her model, all of whom share in producing and presenting her work. She combined her strong background in sewing with studies of ethnic costume as a student at the University of California at Davis and Fiber Works in Berkeley to create a foundation for her solutions to designing with pleated textiles. In my studies of, in textiles, back, way back at Davis actually, I was working with ethnic textiles and costume and the construction of those kinds of clothing from all over the world. Um, and that was my interest. And I actually did a little bit of money making and making, making ethnic costumes to sell for various people, friends mostly, and nothing that I showed at the time. And when I got to Fiberworks, there was, I had an opportunity to work with Ralph and Mary Hayes, who have a wonderful, extensive collection of Chinese textiles. And they allowed me <laughs> to uh, help them renovate, uh, or I guess that's the right word, some of their textiles for a show that they were having at Fiberworks, and the, the very wonderful piece that I got to work on was pleated. And it was stitched in such a way that, um, from behind, by hand, that the pleats, when the wearer moved in the skirt, the Chinese skirt, that the pleats would open and close in a honeycomb fashion. And some of these, there was some embroidery on top that, uh, when the pleats moved then, would create the illusion of of that image, that um, embroidered image moving. And all this fascinated me so much that right then and there I decided that was really the beginning of, of pleated clothes, clothing for me. I was able to be in that program and got an MFA in textile art. And somehow at the end, very much at the end, realized that it was uh, all right to focus on wearables, on clothing. and did that. My master's show had uh, pleated clothing in it, photographs and the real garments on the wall. Um, I was quite a 
valuable experience to hang the show myself. And the emphasis really then was the garments were sculptural pieces that could be on the wall as well as being worn on the body. And at the opening, um, I met a woman who, was, who had a gallery in San Francisco and said, oh, as soon as the show was done, please, can I have all these garments to be in my gallery? And I was just shocked. I thought, geez, someone wants them to be in their gallery. They might even sell. Wow. Ellen moved to New York and showed her work at the Rhinebeck Craft Fair, which she calls one of the best things I could have done. As a result, she established contacts with galleries throughout the country and met Joanne Rapp of the Hand and the Spirit Gallery in Scottsdale, Arizona. The idea that we show clothing and we show glass and we show f fiber wall art, wood, metal, um, and that they interrelate, that we could move Ellen possibly up into the window next to a um, glass object or juxtapose a ceramic piece and recognize that they both stand on their own, that Ellen's garment is important, that the ceramic is important, that they don't serve as a um, crutch for each other, but they enhance each other, I think is a very important ingredient. I'm sure the first time I saw her work, I said, this is important. I think we've had a continuing relationship since that time. I don't think we've ever had a time when the gallery did not show her work in some small or large way. She's been in several group presentations. She's had individual presentations, features, and, and now a one, one person show. She is designing work to be worn. I think the most exciting thing is to have someone come in and try her work on and recognize that this enhances the body. It's carefully thought out. She's, she's uh, worked out the details of how the body will move and function within her the realm of her art. Her art works on the body, and I think that's something that we are encouraged by and um, continue to strive uh, toward showing, whether it be Ellen or um, any other American artist working in clothing. I guess one of the reasons that uh, I chose wearables um, over any other kind of art form is that it's a functional piece. It can, it can be worn, it can be used, it can be admired uh, on the body. Um, some people do choose to hang up their clothes to be looked at in the home, but um, I really feel strongly that a piece of wearable art be functional, that people can uh, use it easily without feeling like they're ruining it or that they might not be able to wash it afterwards or whatever. It should be just as easy to wear as your underwear and a sweatshirt and and but maybe in, in, in my case be um, more expressive of hopefully um, the wearer's inner self which is what clothing to me is you know is for is that people express themselves through their outer layer at the beginning I did have to experiment with fabrics obviously well not obviously but uh, from my background and interest in uh, ethnic costume and textiles. I wanted to only use natural fibers if I could. Unfortunately, silk, uh, silk well, cotton holds a pleat for about five minutes and then <laughs> forgets all about being pleated. Uh, and silk pleats very nicely but doesn't keep. It turns out, I mean, I've, I did make a line of clothes in silk and uh, the customers all brought them back. So, you know, they, if they get spilled on or or um, satin, they just don't hold the pleat permanently. So I really had to, s had to switch to synthetics, and the best synthetic for me has been polyester, not only because it really seems to hold the pleat forever. I, can, I have garments that I've had for years that I wash, and I sit in, and I spill on, and, and they're just, they still look just as good as when I made them. But in addition to that, it seems that most of the polyesters I buy are from, from Japan and they have put a lot of effort into making a very high quality fabric that really resembles silk. Uh, many people can't tell the difference unless it's told to them. So uh, I do have a good 
product. It just happens to be polyester instead of a natural fiber. But then it's durable. It lasts for years. It can be washed. It can be packed. It can be trombled on. It can be, <laughs> it can be used like clothing is used and not suffer. To describe the process that I use, um, I will often just work with the fabric on the table. And while I'm there having it in my hands, really, is when I decide, oh, this would look great as a top with this fabric over here as, as the skirt or a dress in these two fabrics. Maybe I can piece these things together. Um, a lot of it really is in the hand. I don't use the dress form a whole lot. And, um, and sketches really only once in a while. It really is working with the fabric that's the most, where most of my ideas come from. And, and in a way, it's almost like the fabric dictates to me what needs to be done. And if I have enough of it, it can tell me two or three ways that it, <laughs> it needs to be done. In many cases, I just have measurements of rectangles that get pleated in certain ways when I cut out a garment. Um, and I rip most of my fabric, so I'll just go rip it into rectangles or squares, whatever it needs to be. And in a few cases, I do have a paper pattern that I lay out flat um, on the fabric, and I'm able to just cut. Uh, most of my, uh, all of my garments are really reversible. The front and the back are identical. And this really evolved from uh, a rejection of traditional sewing methods. Uh, if I need or want in a garment to have uh, a little bit of extra shoulder emphasis. That comes not from a shoulder pad underneath the garment, but from the way the seam is sewn so it'll stick up by itself. And the pleats opposing one another will create a sort of a rigid line. So I prefer the fabric to really do what it does by itself rather than try to manipulate it with darts or with all those other traditional ways that I find unnecessary. And that, that all, again, comes back from the ethnic garment background. I was very lucky to be in Berkeley where there was a pleating company nearby once I decided to do pleats. I think I would have, I don't think I could have continued had there not been a factory nearby. It seems that much of what I do now certainly re uh, relies on other people, uh, the f a factory, um, people who make the fabric that I buy and that sort of thing. But anyway, going back, when I decided to work on the pleats, I never really did any pleating on my own. Uh, I went right to the factory, <laughs> fortunately, that was there, and met the men there, as uh, Frank Wood at the time. And um, he was very accommodating. When I look back on the little pieces of fabric that I brought him to do all my little experiments on what happens to these prints, what happens with this kind of pleat and that kind of pleat, I remember one time bringing 62 pieces of fabric of about this size <laughs> to pleat in this direction and that direction. Everyone had a, a different instruction. And he did it for me, no, no problems. <laughs> I, was, I mean, without that kind of uh, accommodation on his part, I, I just couldn't have done what I've, what I've done. I don't think, had I been in New York, I could have found anyone that would be willing to do that. So it was really fortuitous for me that, that I lived here and that I developed this pleading interest here. So I worked with them and I have had my pleading done at the, at the factory where they have pleading done either by large machines or on the table in, in uh, paper patterns. Now that I know more about what I'm doing in the last two or three years, I will cut the garment out. Uh, whether that be a dress shape with sleeves or um, pants or skirt is just a plain rectangle, whatever it is, I cut it out ahead of time. I've learned to put little notches in so that when I get it back from the pleater, I just zip it up on the machine. I don't have to do any measuring when I get it back. So I'll stack, uh, cut things and stack them in stacks to go to different machines, if, if you know, certain kinds of pleats go through one machine and then the crystal machine has its own stack, or the hand pleating paper patterns uh, all go in another stack. So that when I take this stack to Rusty, 
all this fabric or send it to him, which I've been doing also. Um, everything is labeled and bundled so that he knows exactly where it has to go. And all the instructions are very clear. And of course, working with him all these years, we have our own language back and forth, what needs to be done. And he can do it and send it back the very next day. I had used for a number of years a home sewing machine on all my work. And it has been a very sturdy machine. And I've I developed a way to stitch edges and seams together by rolling them so that there'd be no seam allowance and everything would be bound up together so that I could have this little rolled edge either on, on a hem or on a seam. And then just recently uh, found that I could buy and have in my own home a, an industrial machine that will cut off the edge and stitch and bind the edge in thread, uh, which I find much preferable. Not only is it uh, faster, but um, it gives me a chance to design with an edge because I can use a contrasting thread, contrasting color, or put a line somewhere where there normally wouldn't be. And I discovered that it was, it made the garment a, um, a little more professional looking actually without going out of the realm of being uh, a handmade um, wearable art piece. I could still keep that quality in my garments with using industrial and factory techniques. I very rarely make a one-of-a-kind garment. Maybe every time I have a one-person show, I might make three or four one-of-a-kinds, which really means the fabric combination is unique. Um, possibly there's one or two details that wouldn't be repeated on another garment in that particular way. But mostly, a lot of what I make are the same silhouettes or the same shapes, new fabrics, new edges, um, maybe a variety of lengths in the garment. Ellen feels her strength lies in selecting and combining the various materials. She often commissions hand-dyed fabrics to create a unique look and works with designer Leslie Carell to create jewelry to complement her clothing. She found that her customers and friends actually helped her design decisions. I did have a customer once. I made this wonderful jacket, and I still think it's one of the most innovative and sculptural pieces that I've ever done, the fold and button jacket. And I made it to go one way as a jacket open in the front. You know, wear it one way, and I gave it to my customer. Here, this is a great jacket. When I came back to her house to, to um, one time to visit her, she said, "Ellen, did you know you can wear this upside down? <laughs> Look!" And she showed me how it, how you could play with it upside down. And then, somewhere along the line, a few a month or two after that, another customer said, "Did you know you could wear this backwards and you can tie it in the back and you can do this?" And it looks very different. And so I had a garment that I had created, but um, this process of turning it over to the person who's going to wear it and letting them help redesign it and, re and work it some more is very valuable to me. Collaboration has played a major role in Ellen's work. Photographer Elaine Keenan and model Darlene Carlson have worked with Ellen since her master's show, influencing not only the marketing process but the design process as well. The photography sessions often become impromptu experiments in styling and design. One thing that the photography work has done for me, uh, as I mentioned before, just being able to see other people's points of view on how the garments can, can be, can be used and worn. Not only does uh, my friend Darlene, who models the clothes, uh, move in a certain way and look a certain way and, and really takes the garments on for her own for that period of time that she's wearing them and uh, work with them. But Elaine, who is, beh who is behind the camera, um, also sees, an, sees that whole outfit in, in uh, a certain way and wants to photograph it in a certain way. We've worked together really as a threesome. There's been equal input. It hasn't just been the designer telling the model how to put her hands. You know, it's, 
it's really a, a give and take on all three parts so that we're all concerned about the product that comes out. That photograph is important to everyone, not just to me. I think the finished product, when I get my photographs back, um, not only helps me really um, keep my whole look in mind when I'm designing and you know, at other times, but when I am able to take those photographs and send them to galleries and send them to be reproduced in newspapers for shows and that sort of thing, um, it really represents all of me, my work, uh, how it looks on someone, how it can look on someone. I think that even though a photograph is a still photograph, people who look at that who might want to wear that piece of clothing can almost see it in motion. They can see other things happening with it. Say, well, if I was wearing that, I could do this with it, I could do that with it. And that's really a, uh, a good way to sell. Um, I find that if I hadn't had the photographs done, I don't think I'd be selling nearly as much as I do now. I would recommend to anybody who's trying to sell this kind of work to, have, to really invest in a good photographer so that those photographs can be shown to people when you can't be there yourself. But the other thing is that I've discovered from going to openings is that customers really want to meet me. They want to talk to me about the way the clothes fit. I learn from customers a lot. But also, uh, clothing, you know, the wearables, it's a personal item. They wear it right next to their body. And um, to have the designer or the artist there to help them make, maybe make some decisions on how to wear it best for them, or maybe to talk about alterations so that it fits them personally rather than you know, anybody. Uh, it, it really helps sell the garment a lot. Every time I've traveled to a place where my clothes are, I find that customers flock to me and buy. And when I leave, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not as strong a buying trend. So I think that the way to go for me, one way, is for it to have trunk shows. And I've been asked to give one or two of those in the near future. And I think they'll be quite successful, taking the clothes there in person, being there, working with customers, tape measure around my neck. You know, they, they want to know how these things are made, too. They're, um, they're magical in a way, but, but they like to know that they can be made just for them. And that's really important. While in New York, Ellen worked with a manufacturer who wanted to promote her line on a larger scale. It was mass-produced and sold throughout the country at major specialty stores, including Saks Fifth Avenue and I. Magnon. It seemed that uh, those being self-service kinds of stores, that my clothes, which look kind of wimpy on a hanger, needed some, some attention from the salesperson to show the customer what it could do. You could wear it this way, this way, whatever. And, um, that just didn't happen in a, in a large store. So it seemed logical to go back to working with galleries and small boutiques where the owners and the salespeople really loved the clothes and really cared for them and really knew what to do with them with their customers. And that seems to be the most successful thing for me right now. It also allows me to keep my business in my home rather than relying on even more people, uh, say in factories or or whatever to handle the work. I can keep a much tighter control over the quality of the work, whereas for that brief time that it was in the factory, I could see things going out that didn't make me completely happy. <laughs> so this was, it was a good experience though. I learned a great deal from being in the factories and seeing how they operated and what could be done, what was possible. Uh, I needed really to develop an image for myself and my business, and I uh, decided the simplest thing would include my signature. So my signature is on my label that I put in each garment. My hang tags and my cards are really the same. I have a photograph that depicts really the feeling of my clothes, the sculptural quality, and it shows the pleats, and it has my signature on it again. So. Um, 
all those things appear either on the clothes or in, let's say, uh, some of that photograph has appeared in a numerous uh, magazines and newspapers for advertisement for some shows. So that image has been seen many times. And then when people see it, they say, oh, yeah, I know what that is. So it's recognizable. The other thing I find, uh, my clothes are fairly reasonably priced, but accessories like the obikin and a squiggle, uh, the I have leggings, various scarves, those things are s relatively inexpensive. And I find that for marketing, it's good to have some of those things around that constantly sell. They can sell as gifts. People don't gasp when they want to buy them. And they can buy them for other people. So those are, those are good things to have. The other thing that I've done with some objects, I do have one accessory in particular that can be worn numerous ways. That's one of the things that, that I like about some of my favorite pieces of clothing that I've designed. They can be worn. Um, in different ways, the jacket upside down backwards. And this particular accessory I call an obikin, and it, it's a, a belt to be used with a chopstick, or it can be made to, to be used as a muffler, or a head wrap, or a camisole. And I've developed, with the help of friends, again, uh, packaging that shows the uh, drawings of each of these ways that the piece can be worn. So a person can pick up the package, which looks nice, it's a clear see-through box, see what, the, what it is inside, and then look at the, the drawings to see, oh, you can wear it this way, this way, this way. And I think that helps a lot, too. The, my sales of Obikins have gone up considerably <laughs> since, not only since the packaging, but since I changed the name. <laughs> so that was something, also, to, to name it something sort of catchy. It gives uh, it has a, a reference to Japanese clothing, which is really where the idea came from. Um, so that, that's all appealing, I think, to the general public. For me, uh, I love making the clothes, and I find it very exciting to work with all these wonderful fabrics and to work with other artists. But really, I would not be continuing this work if I couldn't sell the clothes. It's important for me that other people recognize the quality want to wear them and feel good wearing them, and buy them. And if a certain style doesn't sell, I stop making it, even if I love it. I might keep make one special one for myself so that I'll always have one, but um, in, I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense for me to keep making things that are going to sit around and not be sold. So that is a very important aspect, and, and I have to keep my eye on that no matter what I do in my business. Um, the direction is to sell the clothes and have fun along the way. Mm -hmm.